Which is so cool. Which with the technical difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Can you push one to Spanish? I'm calling India. Yes. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Patel is on the line <laughs> helping yes, us it's, get it's, uh, it's not Patel, it's Peter. <laughs> it's it's Peter. Peter. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. All right, Trevosai, good morning. Let's, uh, let's begin. So today's daf is Ayin Tess. We're just going to pick up a little bit. I'm not exactly sure Rabbi Richter left off. Amaravant. Okay, so Amarava on top of... Okay, so, we'll say, so you know what? So if it's okay, we're just going to back up just a little bit so that we can go ahead and get the case in its entirety. So today's is Ayin Tess 79. We're going to pick up... Say thank you. We're going to pick up Ayin Ches on the base 78B. And we're just going to pick up six lines up from the bottom, the Orminhi. So, okay... So, but I'm going to go quickly, I promise. It's, gonna, it's not going to take you back too far. Just this way, we're dealing with the case of the, of the bucket filled with water of the paraduma. So you might as well just go ahead and just look at that case again. So also remember, again, we're in the midst of a really fascinating sugya that, that I know as Rabbi Richter went through with you yesterday, a number of incredibly important halacha lamaisa sugyas center on this. The dinim of bittel, of nullification, the concept ultimately, again, of chazusa, of when you have a mixture that ultimately changes appearance, what the impact of appearance is on a mixture. So with that, the Gemara says as follows. Well, the Gemara is the Kasha. If you have a bucket that is filled with saliva and you immerse it in a mikvah, ki'ilu lo tava. So the immersion, for the, the immersion for the bucket is in valve. So we're talking about a case over here where, when I said the bucket itself, the kli is tame, and therefore requires immersion in a mikvah. If it's filled with saliva, so the Brice Paskins, that the immersion is invalid. Why is the immersion invalid? So Rashi points out over here, Kilo lo tava, Rashi Divya Maschil, right across in Tosos Deli, Sharok of Vuhotis Pifne Amayim. Saliva is thick. And apparently, again, from Chazal's perspective, the thickness of the saliva does not allow for the penetration of the water. And as such, again, therefore, we don't view, we can't, it's as if the water doesn't fill up the inside of the kli. Therefore, by definition, the kli is still tummy. For, uh, that's case number one. May raglaim, what happens if the bucket is filled with urine? So roin oso ki'iluhin mayim. We view the urine as if it's water, and therefore, by definition, the kli is tahar, because if you ultimately, again, I will say, why would the kli be tahar? So this is an incredible halacha that I'm sure you, you Rabbi Rechter, have touched on yesterday. When it comes to hilchos mikvos, there is a concept called hashaka. Hashaka literally means, from the like the lashon of neshika, to kiss. When you have, quote-unquote, regular water, that comes in contact ultimately again with mikvah water. So the fact that the regular water touches or kisses the mikvah water turns the regular water into mikvah water. We'll say our mikvahs today operate with the principle of hashaka. You don't usually have 40 sa'a uh, of, uh, well, we're not getting into all filchos mikvahs, but very often today our mikvahs operate based on this principle. That's how the ability to incorporate other waters other than rainwater into the mikvah as well, based on the concept of hashaka. So what the Bryce is saying over here is that if you have urine, so urine has the status of water, so therefore when the bucket of urine goes ahead and is immersed into the mikvah, Maybe don't use the mikvah afterwards. So that's a different discussion, right? Then, then ultimately, again, the the bucket itself becomes tahar. Else, the concept of hashaka. Look at Rashi. Even though the urine obviously has a different color and therefore a different a different uh, image, right? It looks different than the other waters. Kevan de min mayimim. Ultimately, again, urine is looked at still halachically as water. Lo boy ruba levatuli elaron also. So ultimately, again, we view it as if it's water. We view it as if it's water. Mole mechata. So we'll say, here's the case we're going to focus on today. What happens if the bucket is filled with mechata? So we'll say, remember again, what's mechata? That's the spring water mixed with the ashes of the para aduma. This is the para aduma concoction, the para aduma mixture. So halochal So let's say the bucket is filled with this. So listen to this. Ad shiir buhamayim al mechata. The halocha is that the bucket, and I'm going to say, remember in all of these cases, why am I immersing the bucket? Why? The bucket is tummy. Right, the bucket is tummy. That's what's happening over here. I'm immersing it in the mikvah order to even tire the bucket. So again, remember, the only ch- the challenging part in all of these cases is that the bucket has contents. There's stuff in the bucket. So now in case number one, it's saliva. The bucket is not tar because we say the water doesn't penetrate the saliva. Case number two, which is urine, we look at urine as water, and therefore again, the bucket is tar. Case number three, the bucket is filled with para-aduma water. 
So what says, what do I do with this case? So what's the halacha? Ad sheir bu amayim amechatos. You need to make sure that you have a majority, 51% of mikvah water, inside, inside the bucket itself, and then the bucket becomes tahar. Look at Rashi. Ad sheir bu amayim. Ein tevila ola lekli. Ad sheir shpoch mehem yose mechatsi of shalkli. Kedei sheir bu amayim manichnos and amechatos. So when looking at the in contents on the inside of the bucket, there must be 51% mikvah water to 49% para aduma water. If that's what you have on the inside of the bucket, then the bucket will be tar. Anything less than 51%, but it's not really 51%, you know, it's 50 point something percent, right, of, of mikvah water, the bucket will remain tame. So the Gemara says, Man sham isle, the isle rowan. Now, we'll say now in general, who is the opinion who says that rowan, that we subscribe to Hansel Rowan? So remember again, rowan was the idea that whenever you have a foreign, a foreign liquid mixed into a mikvah, we look at it as if what? As if it were to be red wine. And then we would determine the impact of that foreign substance based on the mikvah as if it were red wine. Who is that opinion? Look at Rashi. Man sham isle, man sham isle, dama rowan. So I'm sorry, before I look at Rashi, it's Rabbi Huda. So look at Rashi just a moment. So we'll say, who is the opinion who says that when you have a foreign liquid, you look at it, you look at it as if it's wine. So we'll say, that's how you judge its impact on the mikvah. That's Rabbi Yehuda. Yet, vikatani disagi leiberuba. Yet, when it comes to the waters of the Para Aduma, what do we say? We say, as long as there is a majority of mikvah water, to a minority of paraduma water, that is going to be enough. In other words, we don't say that what? We don't say that we view the waters of the paraduma as what Rabbi say as wine, and figure out again how much wine could you have and still maintain the proper coloration of mikvah water. Instead, we just go ahead and we make this all about rov. Amra Baye Baye says it's not a kasha. It's not a kasha. Top of Ayin Tassam and Aleph. Hadidei Hadrabe. Well, say, in fact, we're going to see that there is the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda himself, and there is the opinion that Rabbi Yehuda mentions in the name of his Rabbi, as we're going to see who is Rabbi Gamliel. Take a look at the first Rashi and Ayin Tassam and Aleph. Had Rabbe, Had Istan La'el, Rowan also, Ki'ilu Hu Yayin Adom, De Rabbeihu, De Machmir Bebitl, Ki'hechi De Machmir Beminu Bamino. Well, say, as we're going to see, Rabbi Yehuda himself is actually Mekel is actually more lenient when it comes to determining the halachic status of mixtures. It is his Rebbe, Rabbi Gamliel Rabosai, who is of the opinion that when you have a foreign substance mixed into a mixture, again, we'll focus on mikvos, because that's what we're talking about over here, that foreign substance is looked at like red wine, and therefore we determine the impact of the foreign liquid on the mixture as if it were to be red wine. That is the opinion of Rabbi Gamliel, his Rebbe. This Sanya, Bosa, here's the Braisa. This Sanya, Rabbi Huda Mishom Gamliel. Rabbi Huda says the name of his Rebbe, Rabbi Gamliel. Ein dam mevatel dam. We'll say one type of blood is not mevatel, another type of blood. We'll say, so again, we saw references to these cases before. We'll see this again later on. So Rashi points out over here, Eitzel zrika of Eitzel kisui. So one type of blood cannot be mevatel, another type of blood. Ein rok mevatel rok. One type of saliva cannot be mevatel. So where does this come up? Rashi says, Hatar mevatel rok zav. So we'll say, listen to this. This is, for example, the saliva of a zav. It's not just a zav, we're gonna see it's of a nida also, conveys tuma. If you have saliva from a tame person that gets mixed in with saliva from a tahar person, so again, I'm a meal saying over here that one saliva is not mevat, another saliva. I'll both say, we're gonna see, ve'im me raglaim, mevat me raglaim. Similarly, again, if you have the urine of a tahar person, that gets mixed together with, a ta- with the urine of a tummy person. So one urine does not go ahead and be mevat on others, which I will say is another way of saying what? Min bemino eno bottle. I will say all of these are exa- examples of that when you have two like substances that are mixed together, one cannot be mevat on the other, even if what? Even if what? Even if the permitted item has a much larger ratio to the prohibited item. This is the sheet of Rabbi Gamliel of Min Bemino Inu Mavato. 
Rama Rava, Rava Amr, excuse me. So Rava says there's a different interpretation. Suppose they remember, we're trying to figure out the case of the saliva, I, the case of the saliva in the bucket, I understand. The case of the urine in the bucket, I understand. The, the complicated case is the para aduma situation. So remember, how did the Brisa Paskin? The Brisa said that if you have a bucket filled with para aduma water and you want to now immerse it in the mikvah, you can as long as what? As long as what? You have 51% mikvah water inside the bucket to the 49% of the para aduma water. That's what, try, so again, we're trying to understand how exactly to understand that case. So we'll say, so first, first, first possibility is, that's a, not reflecting the view of Rabbi Huda, that's reflecting the, reflecting the view of Rabbi Gamliel. Rava has a different interpretation. He says, Rava Amar, Bidili Shetoch Otar Vigabo Tami Askin. I'm say, this is really quite fascinating. So Rava says, what are we talking about over here? This is a bucket where the inside of the bucket is Tahar, but it's the outside of the bucket that's Tame. So I will say, interestingly enough, with Kalim, with utensils, you can have this kind of situation where the outside contracts Tuma, but the inside does not. So we're dealing over here with a bucket where the outside is Tame, the inside is not. I will say, if the outside is Tame and the inside is not, then how do you purify it? How do you purify it? You have to put it in a mikvah, but the main mikvah need not seep into the inside of the bucket. All I really need is the main mikvah to come onto the outside of the bucket. Now, here is the catch. The Medina, Sagilahu Bechaldun. I'm saying in reality, you do need a little bit of main mikvah to seep into the inside of the bucket. Why? Because I'm saying you want to make sure that the main mikvah gets all of the outside of the bucket, which would normally require the main mikvah just to dip over a bit over the, the lip of the kli, which means that you do have to immerse it, immerse it enough in order that some of the main mikvah come into the kli itself. So the Medina, Meikar Adin, Meikar Adin, Sagi Becholtuhu, all you need is a little bit of main mikvah to enter to the inside of the kli, but V'Rabbanon Hu Degazru, V'Rabbanon Hu Degazru Behu, so we'll say the rabbis were concerned that what? That maybe you're going to go ahead and be concerned about your para aduma water, and therefore you won't fully go ahead and immerse the in kli in the mikvah. In order to ensure that you really immerse the kli in the mikvah, what did Chazal say? You need to have 51% of mikvah water on the inside of the kli as well. So this is a gzir of Osai. So again, remember, me'ikar adin, all I need is the waters of the mikvah to touch the outside of the kli. I don't need any waters on the inside of the kli itself, but out of a concern that since I have a bucket filled with paraduma water, which is very special very, and very, very unique and very rare, so Chazal, we're afraid I'm not going to immerse the bucket sufficiently. So how do they ensure that you have a sufficient immersion? How do they ensure that? By telling me that even on the inside of the bucket, I have to have, I have to have 51% mikvah water compared to the 49% para aduma water. So the Gemara says, And ultimately, again, as long as I have 51% mikvah water, that will ensure that what? That halacha lamaisa, the kli was properly immersed. Amar Rava. So we'll say, the Rava says as follows. Amar Rabbanan betayma, va'amar Rabbanan beruba, va'amar Rabbanan bechazusa. So Rabbi says as follows, the rabbis make a statement when it comes to taste, the taima. The rabbis make a halachic ruling when it comes to rov majorities. And the rabbis make a halachic statement when it comes to chazusa. Chazusa Bose means what? Means appearance. What, when, when do they make their different halachic statements? So say, here we go. Min b'she'en omino b'taima. So we'll say, listen to this. When you have two mixtures, or I should say a mixture, of two dissimilar items. So I will say, how do I determine the halachic nature of the item? And the answer is taste. So we'll say, what's the paradigmatic example of this? Paradigmatic example of this? Basar b'chalaf. Right? Basar b'chalaf, right? Milk, milk gets mixed into meat. So again, how do I determine if the, if the, if the, if the, if in, in a pure sense, how do I determine ultimately again if the mixture is kasha or treif? Taste. Can you taste the milk in the meat mixture? Obviously, that raises a question, which is, right? So who's the Shabbos guy, right? Who's, who's going to be the guy who's going to do it? So remember again, the Gemara Sechus Chumlin says, you're right, you don't use a Jew for this. You use a Gentile. 
and they used Jetta Bikfela. So again, they were professional tasters. And again, I was saying, who, this, this would, you would use a chef, you would use someone who has a refined palate that they could taste it, someone who could be relied upon. But now again, so we, today we use different, the, the, the halacha has evolved, and we use shishim, a six, but in, in a pure sense, when you have a mixture of two dissimilar items, and you want to figure out the status of the item, it is determined by taste. Min bamino, but what if you have two similar items mixed together? So remember, taste, taste is not going to work. Why is taste not going to work? Because it tastes the same. So then, say beruba. Then ultimately, again, the halachic definition of the mixture will be determined ultimately again through majority. Whichever item is the majority determines the halachic identity of the mixture. Hey chadika chazusa. Well, say when I have a mixture with two things, and one thing has an impact on what? On the appearance of the mixture. So I'll say that'd be the example of what? Of what? Of wine that falls into the mikvah. So then, bimara. Then I will say ultimately again, the identity of the mixture will be determined ultimately again through appearance. So I'll say it's a very important, this is a very important statement, which in Meret Hashem, we will elaborate much upon when we get to Masech HaSchulim. But I will say these are three profound statements. Min bamino, right, when you have two similar items, rov, min b'she'ino amino, two dissimilar items, taste, and ultimately again, chazusa, when there's a change in appearance, bimara. Upliga de Rabbi Eliezer, so Elazar, excuse me. So we'll say, so now we're jumping back for just a moment. If you remember again, Reish Lakish Shavose mentioned the case on Ayin Ches Amad Aleph. Reish Lakish said, Hapigal Vahanoser Vahatame, Shebalalon Zebaze Vahachlan Potter. So say, Reish Lakish made a dramatic statement that if you have a mixture of pigal, nosar, and tame, and you mix them all together, and you ate, you ate it, what's Talacho, your potter? Why you potter? Because also Reish Lakish essentially says, that each one is mevatel the other, right? Each iser is mevatel the other. Uh, here Rashi says over here, well, Rish Lakish says, he says, It's impossible that one will not be, will, will, not, will not go ahead and be mevatel the other. So Rashi says over here, Kishu lois osa befev nivla min laso chavero mi uto shalze berubo shalze ubatel ha miut berov vahabatel so I'll we'll say ultimately again, Rish Lakish has this interesting idea where each Isser is mevatel its fellow. So the Gemara goes weiter. So the Gemara, so upligid the Rabbi Elazar. And Rish Lakish argues on Rabbi Elazar. Because what does Rabbi Elazar say? Rabbi Elazar, Kishem Shein Mitzvah is mevatelos azu azu. The same way that one mitzvah cannot be mevatel another one. Kach ein isurin mevatlin zu azu. So to Rabbi say isurin are also not mevatel one the other. So the Gemara says, by the way, from where do we know? Man shamis lei do amar ein mitzvos mevatel zu azu. But I say, where do we see this concept that one mitzvah cannot be mevatel another mitzvah? So also listen to this, it's incredible. Hillel he, but I say, Hillel teaches us that mitzvos are not mevatel zu azu. Where do we see this by Hillel? The Sanya, get ready. Amru alav al Hillel hazakim, sheyakarachan bevas achos, vaochlan mishum shenemar amatzos, Umerorim yochluhu. We'll say, right, what's the raya that ain't mitzvahs mevat lo zu azu? Korech. Korech. What would Hillel do? Hillel would go ahead, Hillel would go ahead and eat matzah, maror, and karban pesach all together. All together. Now, we'll say, now the fact that he ate them all together tells me that what? That ultimately, again, the matzah doesn't negate the karban pesach, but more importantly, the karban pesach or the matzah is not mevatel the maror. The fact that you can eat them all together indicates to us ein mitzvos mevatlos zu azu. Now Tosas says something very interesting. If you look at the bottom, Tosas he says Amrol of Ahelal Hazaki Shai Karchem Vasachos Bizman Abayis Hayeshloshdan Deoraisa Bim Tomar Uminalon de Kasavra in mitzvos mevatlos zu azu Dilma Hayelokech Harbi Mikal Echad VeEchad. The chi hai gavno lo mevatel ki de precious lel. But as Satosa says, this is not a say geraya. Because maybe what? Maybe Hillel just piled it on. Maybe Hillel just put a lot, a lot of karim pesach and a lot of mar and a lot of matzah. And that's why ultimately, again, it does not mevatel zu azu. Now, both say, 
just interestingly enough, so the Gemara, so this the Gemara is quoting over here the Shita of Rabbi Elazar. Rabbi Elazar disagrees with Reish Lakish. Reish Lakish says that isurim mevatlim zuazu. One isur can literally be mevatl another. Rabbi Elazar says no. The same way that mitzvos are not mevatl zuazu isurim. His raya that mitzvos not mevatl zuazu is hilo. The fact that hilo can eat all of this together indicates to us that one mitzvah does not overpower the next. The same way that one mitzvah is not mevat to the next, so too one isra is not mevat to the next. They're both like, who do we pass in like? We actually pass like Rebbe Lazar. The Rambam and Hilchos Psuli Hamukdoshin writes as follows. If you, take, if you took pigle, no sir, and an item that was tummy, and you mixed it together, and you ate it, you're chayiv. And even though I will say you have more of one than the other, ain mevatlo. Ultimately, again, one will not be mevatlo the other. Why? Shein ha isurin mevatlin zeadzas. What's the we passing like Rabbi Lazar against Reish Lakish? Ain isurin mevatlin zeadzas. One isur is not mevatlo another. Therefore, if you go and you eat a mixture of a whole bunch of isurim, you will be chayev. Now I will say I will tell you something very interesting. It's not Pasha, though, that we paskin that in mitzvahs mevat lo zu as zu. I was supposed to remember again, do we paskin like Hillel when it comes to the consumption of Karim Pesach? No. We paskin against Hillel. We paskin against Hillel. We actually pass like the Chachamim that Amas Mimachul does not mean, I will say, I want to just point out, you know, there's a Mufur Shiraya, Mufur Shiraya, that in the times of the Beis Hamikdash, they ate soft matzahs. Right? It's the Rosalvi Chik Rises. The first right, what's the right that they had soft matzah sometimes the base of Mikdash? Is Hillel sandwich. What's like, you ever, right, you know by the, by the Seder when you do your Korek sandwich? I'll say, you know, you know, what happens? What happens? It's a culinary catastrophe, right? You go ahead and you take one bite and what happens? Mamish, it's all over the place. And one thing to yourself, why would anyone in their right mind, Hillel, I respect you so much, but why in your right mind would you make a sandwich like this? The very simple answer is because he didn't make a sandwich. Like they said they had soft matzos, right? So essentially, you know what Hillel was eating on the night of the, of, 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 of the city? A shawarma, right? He had a lafa. He had a lafa. He had some lamb, karam pesach. They used lettuce from maror, and he rolled it all together. A matzos umro miochlu korech rabose means karchan biachad. They wrapped it all together. Now happens to be we don't paskin like Hillel. We happen to do the korech sandwich at at. At the Seder, Zecher, as a remembrance to what Hillel did, but we actually don't go ahead and pass like Hillel. Why don't we pass in like Hillel, Rabbi So the Vilna Gaon, the Gros says, because the Chachamim felt that Tamim are Mevatlim Zuazu, that the taste are Mevatlim one another. If you eat, we know this, if you eat Pesach, Matzah, and Rabbi what happens? What happens? Most importantly, what occurs is you blunt the taste of what? Of maror, maror is really what is blunted the most in this whole mixture, especially if you're using lettuce. Maror is blunted the most. The chachamim say the taste of maror has to be tasted by itself. So the gom says, "You're right. We don't pass in mitzvahs mevat lo zuazu. That's not the issue over here. But tamim mevat lo zuazu. This is just a culinary issue. One taste absolutely is mevat the next taste. Therefore, again, so I just want to point out we paskin." Ain isurin, so we, we paskin that ain isurin mevatl zuazu, just like mitzvah sanat mevatl zuazu. But nevertheless, despite that, we still don't paskin like Hillel. We will not, we don't eat, I don't know what's going to happen in the Behazan of Esa Mikdash, but at least for now, we don't eat everything together. Me'ikr hadin, out of the consumptive, Vilna Gon says that one taste will eclipse the next, and at the night of the Seder, it's important to taste each of the minim individually. Now, you could still hold in mitzvos mevat lo zuazu. When it comes to Pesach Seder, it's not really a din of mitzvos mevat lo zuazu. It's really a din of what? It's really a din of tam mevat lo zuazu. Good. I ain't testing my days. Ten rabbanon. Charson shel zav. What's another interesting case? Charson shel zav v'zava. Also, listen to this. Now, the charson shel zav, Rashi points out over here, is avit shomei raglayim v'nishra. So, both this seems to be like a bedpan. If you have a bedpan that was made out of out of uh, out of earthenware, so what happens? You have the bedpan that was used by a zav or a zava. So they were urinating into the bedpan. Now, obviously, what happens over here with the bedpan is, especially if it's earthenware, it absorbs the urine. Now, what happens? The bedpan, 
the bedpan breaks apart, right? And you have a piece of earthenware. You have a piece of earthenware. So the Gemara says over here that that earthenware is considered to have absorbed the urine of the Zav. And if one goes ahead and carries that, carries, moves that piece of earthenware, their tummy. Because it will say anything that, that has contracted Tumah from a Zav will transmit Tumah also through Hesed, through moving. So if you have the piece of the earth, an earthenware piece of the bedpan of the Zav, which, absor- which absorb Zav urine, you will be Tame if you move that earthenware shard. So the Gemara says over here as follows. Pamishon v'sheni Tame. I will say now, interesting enough if you did the following. What happens if you washed the shard? So if you washed it with water one time, you washed it with water two times, it's still Tame. Shlishi tar. But if you washed it three times, right, the third time you wash it with water, ultimately, again, the shard becomes tar. So we'll say apparently the repeated washing with water seems to have extracted the urine from the shard, and ultimately now it will be tar. Look at Rashi for just a moment. So Rashi says, Gimel tar, Mishanasan socha maim shlosha pamim, tar, shepalto meharaglaim hanivlo in bo. So when you go in and you wash it the third time, so the third time already has the ability to extract the urine which is absorbed into the shard. The Medra Murim, when is that true? Shinas on the Soho Mayim. But that's only if you wash the shard with water. Aval Nolna son the Soho Mayim. So Bose, what happens if you didn't use water? Rather, what did you use? What did you use? Urine. Or as well say, let's say I, I let's say a person goes out and takes the shard, and what do they do? They urinate onto the shard. So now Bose, but the person who's urinating now is what? Is a tar. So the shaila now is this quote unquote tahar urine ultimately work in the same way to remove the tummy urine of the Zav. So the Gemara now says over here, no, it only works with water, will not work with urine. Afilu asiri tummy. Even if somebody tar urinated on that shard ten times, so the tar urine will not remove the tummy urine ultimately of the Zav. So the Gemara says, Rabbi Elazar and Yaakov Omer, Shlish, so we'll say, by the way, I want to point out, do you say to yourself, Really? Like, it's enough that I don't have coffee, right? But now I'm learning about your multiple urinations on a pee, on a shard. But you have to understand something. We live in such a disposable society. But understand, again, if you had a bedpan, if you had a bedpan, ultimately, like, remember, shard doesn't just mean a shard. Shard means a smaller utensil, still usable as, as a bedpan. So ultimately, again, what's happening over here is we want to figure out, can it be recycled? Can it be reusable or not? So the Gemara says over here is as follows. Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov Omer, Shlishi Afa Pish Tar. Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov disagrees. And he says, in fact, the bedpan of the Zav can be purified, but say even without water if it was urinated on three times by a Tahar. So Tahar urine will also work to extract the tummy urine, which was absorbed ultimately inside that bedpan. So man sham is laid to min bemina lo bottle. So let's remember again, according to the first approach, so according to Tanakama, according to Tanakama, the only thing which can purify the Zav's bedpan is what? Is water. Is water. So even if you were to have a tahar urinate on that bedpan multiple times, it still would not go ahead and purify the bedpan. The boss said, What does that tell me? That tells me min bemino eno bottle. That ultimately, again, two like items, one, one, two similar items, one cannot be mevatel the other. So therefore, again, tahar urine cannot be mevatel tame urine. Who is that opinion? Rabbi Huda. So we'll say, man, shall we say, dumber min bamino? So we'll say, whose opinion is the Tanakhama reflecting? It must be Rabbi Huda or Minhu. So the Gemara goes and raises a kasha, pishtan, shetava, so nida. Well, so listen to this interesting case. So let's say you have flax, which was spun by a nida. So we'll say, now everyone knows that in order to spin flax, what has to happen? You have to moisten it. So if you're spinning flax, how are you usually moistening the threads? With your saliva. So we'll say, watch this. Now, the saliva of a nida has the status of a saliva of a zub, which means that it's tummy. Now we'll say, now what happens? So therefore, if a nida is going in and spinning flax, the issue is that flax was moistened with her saliva, which means the flax has the ability to be tummy. Therefore, masito tahor. And I will say, if somebody moves that flax, ultimately, again, if somebody moves that flax, it will be tar. And I will say, now why? Because we assume that what happens to the saliva, it dries. Once saliva dries, it no longer is conveyed tuma through contact or through moving. So if the needle spins the flax with her saliva, but then her saliva dries in the flax, if somebody else touches or moves the flax, they're tar. 
But if the saliva was still moist, then masito tame, ultimately again, if someone moves the flax, ultimately again, they will be tummy. Why? Mishu mashkepia. Ultimately again, because of the saliva in her mouth. So as I saw, that, that's the halacha. Rabbi Huda Omer, af harotvo bamayim tame, mishum mashkepia. So I say, ultimately again, listen to this, even one who goes ahead and subsequently moistens the flax with water will still become tame because ultimately again, based on mashkepia, because of the saliva of her mouth, va'afilo tuva. So we'll say, this is, now, now this is a follow-up case. Rabbi Huda says, Rabbi Huda says, that if you subsequently moisten the flax, even with water, if you go ahead and now you touch it or you move it, you will become tame. Why? Because of the saliva of her mouth. Va'afilo tuva. Even if there is a lot of water. Look at Rashi. Rabbi Huda Omer, af haroto ma'im tame, mishu mashkepia, b'to seftu m'sechas taros, af ha'malach lo chob ma'im la'achar shia. We should listen to this. Rabbi Huda is adding something else. Even if the flax dried, flax dried, you subsequently re-moisten it with water. What's going to be the halacha? Chazer harok lihios lach, machmas hamayim v'tame mishum mashkapia. Ultimately, again, so what does it do? I will say, it almost it sounds like it what? It reactivates, it reactivates the saliva. So I say, so what's the pshat? How could that be? We just said before that once the saliva, so remember again, we have three cases. Case number one, right, is the, the nida is spinning the flax. She moistens it with her saliva. Case number one, the saliva dries. What's the status of someone who touches the flax? Tar. Case number two, the saliva is moist. What's the halacha? Tame. Case number three, the saliva dries, but ultimately, again, somebody re-moistens the flax with water. What does Rabbi Huda say? If you touch the flax, you're what? You're tummy. But what's the pshat? I don't understand. Once her saliva dried, it dried. Why should reintroducing water reactivate the saliva? To which the Gemara says, Amara Papa, shiny rope. So I will say, now the Chidish over here, by the way, is not only does it reactivate the saliva, but even what? Even if you introduced a lot of water to the point that there's much more water than saliva, still if you go ahead and what? If you touch the flax, you're going to become tame. Amara Papa, shiny rope, the courier. Saliva is different, I will say. Why is saliva different? Rash says, the courier. Nichnas bepishtan the chazaka the kasha lotes. But say the difference over here is that saliva gets firmly embedded in the in the in the stalks themselves, and ultimately again it's never fully extracted. Therefore, when the water is there, it reactivates it and never fully extracts it. About meiraglayim lo belii becheres kulihai. But I will say ultimately again. Ultimately, again, but urine is different. And that's why, again, halacha lamayin, so urine can go ahead and what? Urine can be extracted. Urine can be extracted, ultimately, again, with three times. And I will say the way that Raman Paskins is, the, za, the, the, the urine of the zav can be extracted even with three subsequent urinations of a tahar person. Even min bamino, ultimately, again, will extract the, the, the urine of the zav, ultimately make the item tahar, but ultimately saliva becomes firmly embedded. So the Gemara goes by turn. So we'll say, so the Gemara goes, what was the question? Yeah, it's, it, but it sounds like here, we're talking about different cases, doesn't make a difference. Does, does, doesn't make any difference. That, that's not, the, the Gemara doesn't seem to feel that that's, that that's really the groove over here. Yeah, doesn't seem to make a distinction. So we'll say the Gemara goes weiter. So we'll say, so again, so the way the Gemara is coming out over here is that when it comes to the cheres of the Zav, so once, the, although, so once it absorbs the urine of the Zav, the urine of the Zav can be cleansed or be purged from the utensil with three subsequent cleanings. Whether that's a cleaning of water or a cleaning of tar urine, it will work. When it comes to ultimately, again, the flax that absorbs, the flax that absorbs the saliva of the nida, if it's dry, it doesn't convey tumma. If it's moist, it does convey tumma. And apparently the saliva can be reactivated even through the introduction of water. The Gemara goes later. So we'll say now the Gemara makes mention to the last machlokis in the Mishnah. So the last, the last machlokis in the Mishnah we'll say was as follows. That ultimately, again, the... The Gemara says, the Gemara says that if you have blood that is mixed in, blood that gets mixed together, so the, Gemara, the Mishnah's case was Dama Tamsis, so if you, if you get what we call sacrificial blood, which was Dama Nefesh, with Dama Tamsis, 
Rabbi said, Tama Tamsis was the rest of the blood which trickled out of the animal. So the Tanakama said, Yishpach Lama, you poured down the drain of the base of Mikdash. Rabbi Eliezer says, it was kosher. It was kosher. So Rabbi says, it says the Gemara as follows. But my community, what are they arguing about? Amun Avzvid, Begozrin Gzera B'Mikdash Kamiflagi. What they're arguing about, Rabbi say, is, are we Gozer Gzeros? Do we make preventative decrees in the base of Mikdash or not? The Mar Sever Gozrin, Umar Savar Lo Gozrin. One opinion says we are Gozer. One opinion says we're not Gozer. We'll say, take a look at your Ashi for just a moment. The Gozrin Gzerba Mikdash Pligi. Im Osin Siyag Bekotshim. Laharchik Min Ha'avera. Velo Chayshinan Lahafsid Kotshim. Shalo Yafsid Es Elo Bishvil Siyag Da Achirim Kamifligi. So we'll say, ultimately, again, the Machlokis over here is as follows. Do we make protective, pr- pr- protective, um, Xeros, yeah, protective, right. Go, do, we, do we make protective Xeros by Kachim in order to distance people from making mistakes, even though what? Those Xeros will lead to a wasting of Kachim. So we're going to see how this comes up in just a moment. So the Gemara says, so Tanakama says yes. And therefore, what they're both saying, if you have a case of kosher blood, kosher sacrificial blood, that gets mixed together with what? With, with Tame, with, with non-kosher sacrificial blood. Even the even though what? There's a lot more sacrificial blood than non-sacrificial blood. The Tanakama still says what? Pour it all out. Why, Rabbi Osai? Because what are we concerned about? We're concerned about a case where there is more tame blood than kosher blood that you may come to use it as well. So in order to prevent us from potentially using to pretend for potentially using non-kosher blood for sacrificial purposes, we will tell you to pour out any mixture of blood, even the water bowl site. You hear incredible Kiddush? So we'll tell you to pour out any time that non-kosher blood, when I say non-kosher, I mean not fit for sacrificial use, gets mixed together with sacrificial blood, pour out the whole thing. Even though there might be a rove of sacrificial blood, because we're concerned that what? If we allow you to use this mixture, you may come to what? Use a different mixture, where ultimately, again, there's more non-kosher blood. So, however, Umar Sabaloka Zinan, Rabbi Loza says, no, we're not goes like that. If there is a majority of sacrificially fit blood, then what? Then what? We're going to tell you to use that. Rabbi Papa, Rabbi Papa says, no. The Kuli Amma goes, and everybody agrees that we make Kazeris in order to safeguard the sanctity of sacrificial service in the base of Mikdash. So what's the Machloka of Sovi Rabbi Osai? V'hacha, Plus, I hear there's like a Matthias to Kamachlokes. What's the Machlokes? Is it common to have more dam, ta- dam Tamsis than Dam Hanefesh? Is that common or not? So, let's remember again, Dam Tamsis is the blood that, f- Dam Hanefesh is the blood that spurts out after Shrita. But not just the initial blood, that flows for a little bit of time. So, the Shaila is, is it common to have more Dam Tamsis than Dam Hanefesh? So, the Gemara says, Mar Savishriach. So one opinion, i.e., the Tanakhama says, yes, it's shriach, therefore you pour out the mixture. Uma sarvalo shriach. And the other opinion of Loza says, no, it's not shriach. To which the Gemara says, Bishlam al Rapa, Bahainu diktani desari, Bidam absul in Yishabech la Amma. O Bidam atam says Yishabech la Amma. So we'll say, according to Rapa's understanding, I understand why it says that, what? Why, why ultimately, again, it says, if the blood got mixed together with Dam Psul and you pour it out, or if it gets mixed together with Dam atam says, but I will say, according to Rav Zavid's interpretation, why not go ahead and group both cases and mention them together? To which the Gemara says, Enachinami, that is a good point, Kasha. So I will say, just you should know, the way we paskin ultimately again in the Mishnah, the way we paskin in the Mishnah is ultimately again like the Tanakama, which I will say is pretty much the way paskin all of these cases, that whenever there is a mixture of anything that is sacrificial, whenever it's anything sacrificially invalid gets mixed in with something else, we get rid of it. We don't use it. That's the way we've, we've seen already. This is the theme over the last number of Mishnahites. We don't rely on Rov. Whenever something invalid gets mixed in, we simply pour it down the drain of the Mizbeach. We'll say, we'll just do the Mishnah, then we'll stop for today. We'll do at least part of the Mishnah. Mishnah. Dam Tamimim, Bedam Ba'ali Mumin. So we'll say, listen to this. You have the following case. Let's say you have Dam Tamimim, we'll say, which means you have blood of a Tamim animal, meaning a kosher animal, that gets mixed together with the blood of Ba'ali Mumin animals. So we'll say, what's Ta'locha? Yishpach La'ama. We pour the blood down the drain of the mis- of the base hamikdash. Good. Kos bekosos. So we'll say this is an interesting case. What happens if one cup of sacrificial blood 
gets mixed together with another cup of blood, one of them being puzzle, one of them being kosher, or I should say, some of them being puzzle, some of them being kosher. What do we do in that case? Rabbi Eliezer Omer and Karav Kos Echad Yikrivu Kalakosos. So Rabbi says, if one of the cups was already part of the Mizbeach, then you could go and offer up the rest. But I say, this is Rabbi Eliezer Lishitaso, because what does he hold? Once one of them was offered, you could assume that what? You could assume that what? That it was the apostle one that was already offered, therefore the rest are kosher. The Chachamim say, Chachamim say, no, even if all of them were offered but one, you still can't offer up that last one, you pour it down the drain of the Mizbeach. Or you have the base on Ikdash. Hani Tunnel and Matabo say another interesting case. What happens if you have different kinds of blood which got mixed together? Some blood, Rabbi said, was a type of blood which are placed below the Sikra. For example, Chatas blood. You have Chatas blood which is normally applied below the red line. That got mixed together. Shin is Arubini Sonalamala. That got mixed in with what kind of blood? Rabbi said, for example, Ola blood. Ola blood which is applied above the red line. So I'm say, now I don't know which blood is which, what do I do? Rabbi Eliezer, Omer Yitin Lamala. Rabbi Eliezer says, just place the blood above the red line. So we'll say, Rabbi Eliezer has a very interesting sheet. What does he say? Do some of the blood applications above the red line. I, what about the fact that some of them are supposed to be below the red line? It's okay. What essentially I say is, everything that's supposed to be above the red line should be above the red line. Anything that doesn't belong above the red line, I actually consider it like what? Like water, like irrelevant. And then I repeat the same process for below the red line. I, so I split the blood in half, essentially. Put some of it above, some of it below. Whatever belongs above should be above. Whatever doesn't belong above is like water. Whatever, do below. Whatever belongs below is below. And whatever doesn't belong below is like water. The Chacham, the Chachamim say, come on, cut it out. Yishapech la'ama, pour it out. I will say this is the Chum Lishitasam. Anytime you have a mixture and you're not sure what is what, pour it out. The Imlo Nimlach Vinas, and I will say, but this in general is an interesting idea. If the coin didn't ask the Shaila, but instead he just did the blood applications, Vinasan Kasher. Ultimately, again, it will be Kasher. Now she says over here, Vim Lav Nimlach Vinasan Kasher, Ha'elyon. Mimeno All right, well, so we'll stop over here. We'll pick up Mirat Hashem at the top, at the beginning of the, at the continuation of the Mishnah, and Mirat Hashem tomorrow. Shkoyach. Oh, so that, we, we, yeah. we never say that. I never, I, I always expected that to be the answer. Yeah, because the, the, pro, the problem is that's not how blood applications work. Blood applications require a cover the, the actual an actual application. Actually, Correct. Right. Correct. Because I always so, thought that would be the eight. Yeah. So it doesn't, it does even though the Gemara has mentioned stuff like that by other, by right. other it never says it here. Yeah, it doesn't say it here. It doesn't say it here. It's true. Uh, wonderful to have you here. Nice to have you. Yeah, back to Jersey yeah. today? Yeah, at some point. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. See yeah. Why don't we have long ones? So the truth is people do. People do. People do. People, there are, there, there are, you can buy soft mantles today. A lot of the spark is it. The issue is an issue of the soul. You know, for the last pretty much like 2,000 years, it's not our tradition anymore. So there are. You can buy it today. It's a lot more expensive. But you can buy it. Say, do you use soft matzo on Pesach? Our matzo was so hard. Six and hard. They had to like, make it red an hour before to make it like it's soft. Otherwise, it would not even Couldn't do that. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, but today... Well, not, I mean, baked soft, then they became very hard. Right, uh, because they were thick, right? Yeah, it was uh, thick. Was they cook yeah. it well to dry up, but yeah. then you don't eat it. it yeah, so Ashkenazic Armasora for like the, over the last thousand years yeah. is thin and hard. I came on and ate the soft masses. the soft masses, yeah. yeah. I wasn't used to water for it. No, no, for Ashkenazim, Armasora is over a thousand years. That they be eating matzah. Like, like we have Ashmara matzah. For the last thousand years, it's unchanged, unchanged. Now again, interestingly enough, you, you could find the soft matzahs with Ashkenazic hechsher also. It's not only for that. You could buy people, people, people eat it. I mean, there's, there's certainly nothing wrong with it. It's just whenever you have something that is alien to our it's, it's always interesting to see. Um, yeah, Mashiach comes. I don't know. Say, did you stop this? Is this? Uh, I was just at the campaign today.
So let's let's do the social home. Okay. Uh, okay. Have a good day. Squeeze into the base medrash? No, for sure not. Oh, the table, okay. What did we do last time? I don't remember. I don't know. Last time we did have a social Meaning you're, you're setting up tonight. You're setting up at 3.30. Setting up at 3.30 tonight. Um, yeah, 100%. Should we do the shul? Not so conducive. I don't know if he's going to be a problem. Okay, do we have, space upstairs, right? we, don't, we don't have any more square tables that we could use, what do we use? Show, show this. We have to have square tables. We use, we use. Okay, no, 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 no. So there's some, let's look at There's some, right? Let's see how many we have. We'll, we'll use whatever we have. Okay. Use whatever we have. Fine, we do that. Case of urine. Uh, it's 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 urine.